This is Office Hours at Duke University. Today, Margaret Gale and William Darity take your questions about the Bright Idea Program for Elementary Education. Gale is the director of the American Association for Gifted Children at Duke. She is a co-designer of Project Bright Idea, which aims to increase the percentage of students from underrepresented groups in gifted and talented programs. Darity is a professor of public policy, African American studies, and economics at Duke. One of his areas of research is the educational achievement gap. To submit a question for Gail and Darity, send an email to live at duke.edu. Tweet with the tag Duke Live or post to the Duke University Facebook page. You can watch today's discussion again anytime on Duke On Demand. I'm David Jarmel, the head of Duke University's Office of News and Communications. Margaret Gale, Sandy Darity, welcome to Office Hours. Thanks for joining us. This morning you released a report that should grab the attention of anyone who cares about our nation's schools and children. Um, the study found that when teachers treat ordinary kids as being talented and gifted, many of these students actually end up performing at a gifted level within a few years. The two of you helped develop this Project Bright Idea. Sandy, describe it for us. So Project Bright Idea is a demonstration project underway in North Carolina that's been funded by the Javits Program of the U.S. Department of Education. And Margaret Gale has been central to the development of this particular program. It begins in kindergarten and it tailors gifted methodologies for regular classroom teachers to use with all of the children in the classroom. Uh, initially, it has focused on K through two instruction, but uh, at least one high school in North Carolina, Fuquay Verena High School, has moved in the direction of implementing a Project Bright Idea style of curriculum for high school age students. It's predicated on the view that all students can learn gifted behaviors, or as the uh, education scholar Lauren Resnick might put it, all kids can be taught to be smart. Yeah, so treating ordinary kids as gifted students, and this study um, has just come out recently um, that examined 10,000 students. Isn't that right, Margaret? Maybe you can tell us what they found. What we found is that when we uh, retrain teachers uh, to integrate gifted methodologies into regular ed methodologies and brought the best practices from uh, all of the national research that we could find, and integrated that into a way for them to be able to go back to the classroom and implement it. And to uh, then, as they did that and saw that their children responded, then the children got excited. And so we were on a roll to get a real motivation in place for teachers and students to work together around new curriculum that they designed together. That's the exciting part. Right. What I found so fascinating, though, um, was that you had an outside evaluator come in right. and look at this program, looked at 10,000 kids, which is, which is a good number, and found that after you treated the students as talented and gifted with those kinds of teaching methods, right. after just a few years, they actually started performing like gifted students. Absolutely. That's, that's the take-home message here. It is a take-home message. And so many of these children also would go home and tell their parents that they had a learning style that they were good in or they had an intelligent behavior or a gifted behavior that they were better at doing. And, and they all you know, were able to talk the language and the teachers had a common language for helping children understand their own behaviors and how they could nurture them. So maybe we could help our, our viewers understand what we're talking about by watching a brief video of some of these children who are doing a lesson about Michelangelo and Leonardo. Margaret, maybe you could set it up for us. That would be great because this is uh, our demonstration school at Thomasville Primary. Which is where? Uh, which is in Thomasville, which North is where? Carolina. Which is where in North Carolina? <laughs> in Thomasville, North Carolina, <laughs> which is also the, uh, used to be the furniture capital area of the world. Uh, but this school had exactly a third white students, a mm -hmm. third uh, African-American students, a third Hispanic and other uh, color uh, students of color. And so it was a great place to go, but it also had a 95, 96 percent 
uh, of low income, uh, free and reduced lunch. Students. And the video that these kids are in which grade? They're in first and second grade, and you will see the primary lead teacher, Don Miller, uh, conducting a lesson where they're studying a, uh, the difference between Leonardo and Michelangelo in terms of who is the greatest creator of their time. And so you'll see students debating, and they will, the other students will have an opportunity to evaluate who the greatest hmm. debater well, let's, and creator is. Well, let's take a look. That would be great. As rate each participant on a scale of one to three using the following criteria. A one, look at your rubric, a one means little evidence. A two means what? Some evidence. A three equals great evidence. And you're going to judge Leonardo on the evidence of the gifts, and you're going to judge Michelangelo on the evidence of the gifts. Let me begin by introducing our two participants. From Vinci, we have Leonardo. And from Caprice, we have Michelangelo. Leonardo, with your fascination of nature, why did you not paint any nature scenes? Because it would be too hard to get any animal from the wild and because I just thought I was better to paint pictures of humans. Michelangelo. Why are you rude to your elder? I'm not trying to be rude. I just think I'm the greatest artist. Take a few minutes to score your rubrics and then be ready to defend who you think's the great creator of this time. Who was Michelangelo? Why? Because he was speaking with clarity and precision. So, Margaret, here we have a group of second grade students. First and, um, first second, and second, second grade, grade, who initially were not identified as gifted students. They're talking about rubrics. They're filling in evidence like scientists. They're debating the merits of Renaissance artists. Not the way I remember my second right. grade classroom. <laughs> exactly. Is this, is this the kind of thing that you've been doing in this project? This is what we've been doing. We take books like Leonardo, The Dreamer, which is probably a book you could use all the way up to eighth grade. And then we also have a unit on William Shakespeare. So these are the rich units that we integrate state standards in that we're required to teach and whatever the local standards are that are added onto that. And then we train teachers how to do this. Sandy, maybe you could build on this. How, does, how would one of these classrooms look different than a typical classroom in North Carolina or elsewhere in the United States? Well, I, I think when I visited the school in Thomasville, I wasn't really able to tell which grade it was. Hmm. And, uh, and a grade that I assumed, based on what the kids were actually engaged in, was the second grade class, because I knew it was a K through two program, turned out to be a kindergarten classroom. Uh, so uh, I, think, I think one of the things that's really distinctive about Bright Idea classrooms is that the idea that there's age appropriate knowledge gets shattered and you find kids engaged in activities that you don't normally think kids their age could be engaged in. And yet it seems to work. It seems to work. And when I interrogated kids to make sure that they weren't sort of spouting mm -hmm. these terms mm -hmm. without really understanding them, it was actually pretty clear that they had a very rich understanding of what they, with these terms that they were using. So, of course, that then means the teachers know how to do this. So Absolutely. you have to train not only young teachers, but the existing teachers. Absolutely. Maybe you could talk about that a little. Yeah. Well, the training is the key because we give every teacher 20 days through the course of a year, but it's culminated with five days of intense curriculum design and writing where teachers, elementary teachers especially, come out of college without a lot of understanding of how to design curriculum tailored to a diverse group of students. So we train them to do that. Mm -hmm. They get excited because they can choose their own interest in what they like to do and tie it in to, to these units and make the standards that they have to teach and all the things they're required to do, it gives them an opportunity to be creative. 
I'm sure when we hear from Danielle, you'll get a sense of that. Right. Well, you're referring to Danielle Dingus, uh, and she's going to join us now by Skype. Danielle, are you there? I'm here. All right. So we're joined by Danielle Dingus. Danielle is a second grade teacher at Northeast Elementary School in Kinston, North Carolina. That's roughly between halfway between Raleigh and the North Carolina coast, for those of you outside of the state. Um, Danielle's in her second year teaching and her second year with the Bright Idea program. Danielle, you just heard Margaret say that, that it's a way to get teachers excited and to learn new concepts. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about your own experience. Um, yeah, we do get very excited about um, Project Bright Idea and Project Tomorrow that we have here at Northeast. And what kinds of, maybe you could tell us um, a lesson you've been doing in the last few days or weeks with your kids that would help us understand the kinds of things you do? Sure. One example, um, this week we've been taking the countywide K-2 math assessments. I had a little boy yesterday raise his hand and I went over there to him and he pointed at his paper and he said, look, Miss D, I was being persistent while I was getting my answer right. And so it's just very, um, you know, shocking to see these kids, they're making the connections to the habits of mind even when they're taking math tests. So habits of mind, what is that? The habits of mind, there are 16 habits of mind um, that the students are exposed to from kindergarten through fifth grade, and it just helps them to understand how to interact with um, other people. So persistence, managing impulsivity, those are just some examples. So, Daniel, I want to get to the heart of the matter, which is this program is, is basically encouraging you and other teachers to look at um, all of the students as being gifted. Um, or at least to use the methodologies that one would use as a teacher in a gifted classroom. Does that require a change in, in your own mindset as well as in the things that you do? Absolutely. Um, a lot of times, especially with the younger kids, um, a lot of teachers will like to, I guess, dumb down the language that they use with students. And what we do with um, Project Bright Ideas is we expose the students to language that they're going to need to know and use in the real world. Right. Um, for example, if I may, last week I was at an AIG conference in Winston-Salem, and the presenter was presenting um, learning contracts for AG students. And, and those are what, what, what does that acronym mean? I'm sorry, AG, Academically Gifted. Okay. Okay, so she was um, exposing or showing us learning contracts, and her higher level, her upper grade learning contract used like the Bloom's taxonomy um, verbs, um, remembering, understand, analyze, create, and she said that, you know, students in K-2 wouldn't understand those, and I turned to the um, lady that I was sitting next to, and I said, we use that in kindergarten and second grade already, so... Um, it's just, it was shocking to me to see that what we're doing with Project Bright Idea um, isn't typically what is done in a classroom, and it's really helping to prepare our students for that 21st century in a globally mm -hmm. competitive workplace. Margaret and Sandy, I, I saw you both nodding your head when she said dumbing down in the classroom. Is, is that what is happening in too many American classrooms? Absolutely. Yeah. I'm really just at a loss that at a time when we should be really raising the level up for all students that somehow we've gotten in our heads that we have to make it simple and use simple words when we can use the real language that we have, mm -hmm. you know, to explain things to students. But you're not just talking about using adult vocabulary. No. It, it's a different way of thinking about the teaching. Absolutely. And this is all developmental, by the way. It's not that we're trying to overlay an adult um, set of vocabulary and pedagogy on students at that age. We're actually developing, uh, using developmental psychology and products that we know work as you take children from the concrete to the abstract. Mm -hmm. There is a methodology for doing that, and that's what our materials do. Sandy, any thoughts about um, the moving from dumbing down into a model not just in North Carolina, but more broadly? Well, I think, I think one of the issues is that to the extent that we treat kids as gifted selectively, we actually partition the quality of curriculum and instruction that kids get exposed to, and we disproportionately locate uh, black and Latino kids in those environments where they get the dumbed down instruction. So one of the exciting things about Project Bright Idea is the premise 
that you provide this high-level curriculum and instruction to all the kids. And so you can, in effect, eliminate uh, what, I, what I describe as kind of internal segregation within schools in terms of what type of education kids get exposed to. Mm -hmm. Daniel, I hear that the, the change that you're seeing is not only academically, but also in the behavior of the students in your class and other classes at your school. Um, I heard a story about one parent saying that her second grader came home and was talking about managing impulsivity. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes, I had a parent come into my class at the beginning of this year, and she said, Miss D, my child said that he needed to manage his impulsivity better, and I just didn't know what to do because I didn't know what that meant. And I just started laughing, and I explained to her what the habits of mind were, and I showed her our habit of mind board, and um, she has actually taken that home, and she is practicing that with her child at home and in the real world at the grocery store. So it's just really um, important for our parents to be involved also so they can continue to um, implement those habits of mind at home. So Danielle, I'm curious, you, you obviously are enthusiastic about the results in, in your classroom. Um, you're obviously a somewhat younger teacher. What's, yeah. What do you hear from other teachers in the school? And I'm thinking about especially teachers who may have been there for a while and for whom something like Bright Idea is gonna be a new idea. Well, you know, Change for some people is is challenging, and you can see that at any school. Um, but I think the majority of our staff here at Northeast is very enthusiastic, just like me. They're doing the very best that they can, um, and they are implementing, you know, our components here um, just as well as I am. And that's an important point because in this school, all the teachers were trained at one time and they had to agree to be trained. Mm -hmm. So this was a, a, an effort to start a school brand new uh, with these principals rather than to go in and try to change one in the middle of uh, another kind of environment. Right, and that brings, so uh, we invite all of you to join the conversation here on Office Hours. You can send in your questions by email, by Twitter, on Facebook. Um, and we've received a question which bears on what you just said, Margaret, and the question is about um, not only how uh, practical would it be to broaden this to other schools, but what would the cost be? Is this something that would be feasible, from a, particularly at a time when budgets are, are in, under so much strain? Well, it does cost to retrain teachers, mm -hmm. and this was costly in the sense that we were bringing teachers into a central location because we had... Uh, teachers from across the state. So we had to pay a lot of extra money for that. But if you could go into a district and do it, and you had release time to do it, then it would be very cost effective. You would only have to pay for the trainers. So I think it's doable. The other thing that's doable is what you provide for the students. But you do need to eliminate some of the things that aren't working. Such as? Some of the staff development. Some of the literacy, liter literacy programs that they put a lot of money into, mm -hmm. absolutely are not research-based. But that's beyond this transition of, of retraining teachers, um, then let's suppose you had all the teachers retrained. Going forward, does a bright idea kind of curriculum fundamentally cost more than we're now spending? Oh, no. In fact, it probably would cost less. Mm -hmm. Because once your teachers are trained, they can take a textbook, they can take any supplemental material and they can integrate it into their work. Hmm. The, the great idea about this is that we're giving teachers tools that they can teach for a lifetime hmm. so that you don't have to take them out every time a new product comes along right. and retrain them on it. And I, you know, our presumption is that if you have uh, greater engagement by the kids, uh, greater enthusiasm about learning, a greater commitment to, uh, to learning as an enterprise, you'll have some longer term effects that would have wide social benefits, including uh, you know, presumably reducing dropout rates, which are astronomical mm -hmm. in, in, in many communities around the country. Uh, and then this would also uh, reduce the, the increased likelihood of kids actually going to prison who ha are part of the dropout population. So uh, you know, there are some, so there's some great uh, cost, social cost reductions that could be associated with having uh, this dramatic change in the way in which we go about teaching kids. Well, Danielle Dingus, you're there on the front lines. You're, the, you're actually in the classroom. And do you feel like you have to work harder than you would or otherwise with Project Bright Idea? Um, I don't 
we don't think about it as working harder. We think about it as working smarter. Um, what we're doing for our kids is very beneficial for them in the real world, and everything that we do is worth it. And how do the parents feel? Um, I think the parents are very supportive. Um, they encourage it, and I think they try to get involved um, with the program as much as they can. Uh, we have another video clip, Margaret, maybe you can help set it up for us, um, of a parent who's a volunteer right. um, doing a lesson on inventions. Exactly, and this is one of the performance tasks, that's what we call them in the Bright Idea Classroom, tied to the Leonardo uh, story and unit, because this parent uh, comes in on a regular basis to volunteer, but she's heading up a flexible grouping of uh, students from both first and second grade, and they're going to do inventions. Good, let's take a look. You're going to think of ideas possible for inventions to help with needs you may have for home or for school. So the first thing you're going to do is think about a need for an invention. Medicine. Medicine, wow. Mine can like clean up messes on the floor. Okay. So do you have a picture in your mind about what this invention is going to look like? I have cow drops and I, and I like cut them and then it goes and then it comes into a person's mouth if they're coughing. Well, we have some supplies here in this tub that's going to help you to sort of try to start creating those kinds of things. You have to wet them because you have to wet them so they can get wet and clean the floor. I didn't know I could make it because at first it wouldn't come on, but I've been persistent to get the piece on. And now I can do it. He's persistent and now he, he can, can do, do it. it. And now he can do it. And now he can do it. So Margaret and Sandy, one of the interesting um, sidelights maybe from the study that you just released this morning was about the kids in the control group. Again, about 10,000 students overall, half were in the, in the Bright mm -hmm. Idea classrooms, but the other half were in regular classrooms, and you found something interesting that happened with them as well. Yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> we, we found that once we moved into the school, and they didn't really know what we were doing in those classrooms, but suddenly there was a different look at students across the board. And other teachers got to thinking about gifted, I think, in a different way or a way to teach, even though they weren't trained and were not doing what we were doing. They started as soon as the teachers in the research cohort got out of that cohort uh, deadline, then the other teachers wanted to do it too. And many of our districts then started training them. Yeah, it's like a positive and contagion so it was effect. A positive <laughs> effect. That, <Yeah>. Right. <laughs> Right, which then gets into the obvious question that many people watching us now must be thinking, which is, um, if this is working so well in Danielle's classroom and in the other classrooms, we now have some data to back that up, why, why are we not doing this more broadly? Well, we've tried, and uh, the state is well aware of this. Uh, Mary Watson, who was the PI on this project and is Director of Exceptional Children in North Carolina, has continued to use this model as an intervention model, and we now have pilots underway to do that in under her leadership. And we are in the process of uh, very soon taking this, hopefully, to the state board. Mm -hmm. at, and hopefully, in the future, we'll be able to use this as a model to do other things in the state. But we're also getting attention on the national level now. We're right. getting visitors who are coming in and want to do it there. So it will eventually get a grassroots effort, I think, and, and move out. Now, Sandy, one of the exciting things that you have found in your research is beyond this project per se, you've done looks at, at other kinds of programs mm -hmm. which have similar results with this basic conclusion that if you treat kids as being gifted, they start acting like they're gifted. Maybe you could talk a little about, about what you found at Southwest Elementary School in Durham. Yeah, so the general principle is that if you upgrade or accelerate curriculum for all students, you get positive results for all students. And in fact, universalizing a high quality curriculum actually reduces the, uh, the magnitude of the racial achievement gap. So in uh, Southwest Elementary in Durham in 1999 to 2000, um, for the fifth grade of students there, 
41 percent of the black students didn't pass the state's <laughs> reading test in comparison with 12 percent of the white students and 23 percent of the black students didn't pass the state's math test in comparison with nine percent of the white students uh, the individual who became principal at the school at the time was a man named David Sneed uh, and when he first arrived at the school, he reached the conclusion that it was important to expand the exposure of a much wider range of kids in the student body to their gifted curriculum. Uh, so it's not bright idea per se, but it's the right. same general principle. And by 2002-2003, only 10% of the black and white students no longer passed the reading test. And less than 3% of both the black and white students in the fifth grade didn't pass the math test. And this is while eligibility for free and reduced lunch rose from 30 to 47% across the entire student body. Mm -hmm. So uh, family background, income status, et cetera, did not prove to be a barrier to improving student performance. Right. And that's exactly what we found, that you... Right, let me just interrupt you. Yeah. Maybe, maybe we could put the statistics, the, the bar yes. graph, up on the screen while, while you're describing what you found with the achievement gap with Bright Idea. Well, we found the same thing, and while we were looking primarily at headcount data, uh, that proved to be true, that everything went up while a lot of the uh, free and reduced lunch statistics were going up. We were lowering uh, the numbers you know, that we're not achieving. And so I think there is a parallel to that that's dramatic. Right. I think the graph that's up. Yeah, Sa the, Sandy, maybe you could explain what, what our viewers are looking at. This is a graph of the achievement gap between black and white students and Hispanic and white students at Fuquay Verena High School. And black and white is on the left and Hispanic is on, the, on right. the right. Yeah, and there's kind of an anomalous fig, uh, bar graph for the... Uh, that's the Hispanic population. The reddish graph, yeah. the reddish bar. Uh, and, and that's because the proportion of, of Hispanic students in the school at that in that particular year was relatively low. So I, I don't think we want to attribute much one way or the other to that data. But essentially what it shows is that after Fuquay Verena High School moved in the direction of... Um, of, of adopting a project bright idea styled curriculum across their entire high school, uh, there is a decline in the disparity in performance between black and white students and between Hispanic and white students. Mm -hmm. Daniel, I have a question for you, which is coming from Stuart, who's watching the program. And Stuart's wondering whether we're also seeing any change in, in any achievement gap that might exist, not just between minority and mi non minority students, but between boys and girls. I'm sorry, could you say between that boys and, Between well. boys and girls. Do you see, does this have any impact on how boys or girls perform in, in your classroom? Um, I'm, I am seeing that our boys and girls, because they are treated the same, they are achieving at the same rate. Margaret or Sandy, is that something that's been looked at? Stuart was wondering. We, we have looked at our um, uh, data a little bit on the gender. We're in the process of really evaluating that more, but we're seeing a similar thing that when you really teach all the students a higher level curriculum and, fle and do fle flexible grouping, that's the key because you're mixing them up more. Mm -hmm. So we've received an interesting email question from Pat. Pat, thank you. The videos of the classrooms look very much like Montessori classrooms. What are the differences between the approach Project Bright Idea takes and Montessori methods? You want to take that, Sandy? Well, I, that, that's a great question. <laughs> it is a great question. That's a great question. Uh, I, think that there, uh, I think that there are parallels insofar as a Bright Idea classroom is trying to provide child-appropriate instruction as opposed to age-appropriate instruction. And so the classroom provides kids with a variety of ways to try to understand a particular concept or idea, which is precisely what Montessori classrooms do. Uh, so it, 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 there may be a tactile strategy for learning something. There may be a visual strategy for mm -hmm. learning something. And in a bright mm -hmm. idea classroom, uh, the opportunity is generally created for kids to approach the concept from a number of ways, and I think that that's the philosophy of a Montessori classroom. So in that sense, there's a strong relationship. And it probably is a little more structured because mm -hmm. we have to meet the state standards. So everything is, the exciting thing is you can have fun, 
you can meet children's interests. If you put it into a structure like a, a long-term unit that does these great units on um, things that interest all students and teachers, and then you get a energy going, but at the same time, you're, you've kind of blended the Montessori mm -hmm. in with what we have to do with structure. Uh, right. Danielle, uh, what Sandy was describing a moment ago about tactile learning and visual learning sounds to me a little bit like Howard Gardner's theory of multiple intelligences, which I know is, an, is, one, of the, is one of the main um, texts that, that you all study in your preparation. Um, is, is that uh, an important concept of kids learn in different ways at different times, and you as a teacher need to accommodate that? Absolutely. Um, we utilize the MIs a lot here. We have MI centers. MIs meaning multiple intelligence. Yeah. Right, multiple intelligence. We call them MIs. Um, we have MI centers here that the kids are um, exposed to, um, which just allows them to learn concepts that we are practicing in class, but they use different strategies how they learn the best. So where one student may um, be very logic smart and may understand um, something from like the math pers perspective, uh, another student may need music to help them understand that concept. So they are able to um, learn what we're learning, but at their own pace and through their own learning style. So Danielle and Margaret and Sandy, what lies ahead for Project Bright Idea? I know there's a name change, but in the next year and beyond, what, what will we be seeing with this program? Well, first, uh, we have schools that are underway under Project Tomorrow, and that's where a whole new school started up and wanted to take some of their own philosophy in with it, and we added the Bright Idea principles. And we also built in the lessons learned from well, our data collection. Mm -hmm. But we also have started an intervention model through a, a federal program, co Coordinated Early Intervening Services, which Exceptional Children Division sponsors. And that's where we want to try to train it, exceptional children, teachers, to do a better job at training and educating that population, but also regular teachers to be able to keep children off of exceptional children roles that don't belong there. We know that we have a lot that are mislabeled. Mm -hmm. And Danielle, for you out there in Kinston, North Carolina, what do you hear from other teachers at other schools in the system or from neighboring towns? Or are they aware of what you're doing? Is this, are people saying, hmm, maybe we ought to be doing this? What's the buzz? Yeah, uh, other teachers at um, schools, they do know that we're doing it. And um, when some teachers don't know and they hear about it, they're like, wow, really? You know, and they're interested and they want to learn more. Um, there are some um, schools in Lenore County who are using um, the habits of mind or the multiple intelligences. They've um, gotten that information from us. During our summer institute, we had um, Southeast Elementary join us for a little bit to learn how they could take back um, the habits of mind instruction to their school. So some schools are trying to implement um, this program. So Sandy, Dar Sandy Darity, let me pull the camera back as it were. We have people watching this program not just from North Carolina, but from around the country and maybe even outside the country. Um, we're talking mainly about these specific school districts in North Carolina and about North Carolina. But what does this mean for the education debate in the United States? Uh, in the past year, we had Waiting for Superman, the documentary, which had got a lot of discussion. We had the whole fight with Michelle Rhee in Washington. Um, educate with Arnie Duncan, who's been a pretty high-profile education secretary with President Obama. Um, there's a lot of ferment about what we ought to be doing in our schools, particularly with at-risk kids. As I look at this study, it sounds like you've hit on something that has some potential to be, to be broader, but maybe it's not the only answer. Where does this fit into the ecosystem of education policy? I think there is something Danielle said that I thought was really powerful. There were a number of things she said that were powerful, but this one in particular. Uh, when you asked about whether or not uh, it, was, it was more demanding or harder for them to, to teach, uh, the bright idea style of curriculum and she said uh, I don't think of us teaching having greater difficulty teaching but we're teaching smarter and I think that that's 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 the key the, providing teachers with an opportunity to teach smarter so that kids can be smarter um, and uh, I think many of the educational reforms or so-called reforms are aimed at uh, 
pushing teachers out, who appear to not be successful in their classrooms. This approach is saying uh, we really need to give teachers an opportunity to reorder and, and, and recreate the way in which they engage with their students. And the training component of Bright Ideas is really critical. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I would also say that in terms of the long view, uh, institutionalizing the way in which schools of education prepare teachers uh, in a way that's consonant or consistent with the, the bright idea philosophy, the universal notion that all kids should receive a high level of instruction, a challenging, critical thinking-based instruction is, is also a key. So yeah, this goes far beyond North Carolina. Mm -hmm. uh, it goes to the very core way in which we think about how teachers should be prepared to engage with kids in classrooms. And yet the education system can be so resistant to change um, for a variety of reasons. Yeah. Um, or, how, or it seizes upon changes which appear to be easier, you know, like paying kids for grades or, you know. Yeah. So <laughs> if, if I had, whether Arne Duncan or a state, led, you know, someone involved in s state education policy sitting here and maybe they're watching the program, yeah. what is it you would say to them? Well, I would say we need to retrain every teacher in America just the way we retrain our doctors and other professions to meet the challenges of the 21st century. If you think about it, doctors treat one patient at a time, and our teachers have a whole classroom of clients that need attention to their mental status and their brain, uh, you know, to develop their brains and to treat those brains with the same kind of level of efficiency and some kind of consistency of practice mm -hmm. that doctors do with our physical bodies. So, um, Danielle, I know you're a classroom teacher, probably not a, a national public policy analyst, but here's your free swing. If you had uh, President Obama or someone sitting here and you wanted to share with them what you think they ought to take away from the experience of you and your colleagues, what would you tell them? Um, well, you know, I just would tell him that this program is, is really important, and I think what Margaret was saying, that we need to retrain our teachers, I think she's absolutely right, and I would tell President Obama that. Um, we need to retrain our teachers. We are the ones who are creating those doctors and the lawyers and the presidents, um, and in order for us to be successful, teachers need to be retrained. Right. Well, it sounds like you've been training your students how to use the Internet because we've received a question from one of your students. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Uh, her name is Kamari. Okay. And yeah, Kamari, don't, don't be nervous. <laughs> Kamari says, Ms. Dingus, how do you like teaching Project Tomorrow? Um, I love teaching Project Tomorrow. I And explain what that is? I couldn't imagine teaching. W what is Project Tomorrow? Uh-oh, Mike. What is Project Tomorrow? Project Tomorrow is um, the program here that we have. It's underneath the Bright Ideas. Um, that's just what we call it here at Northeast. And so how do you like teaching it? I love teaching Project Tomorrow. I think that using the habits of mind and the MIs to teach the kids, they are really learning those skills that they need to be successful. Um, and I couldn't imagine teaching at any other school. All right. Well, since all of this is about Kamari and, and her fellow students, maybe we'll let her have the last word of this conversation. Margaret or Sandy, any final thoughts? No, I just am so excited, though, about the future that we have. If we, whether we adopt this program or one similar, I think Sandy hit on it. We just need to raise the level of dialogue about the right approach to retraining teachers. We need to retrain the teachers, not worry about trying to get rid of who's bad and who's good. We really don't have any criteria for that. Right, right. Sandy? Yeah, I, I would agree to that. And Dan Absolutely. Danielle, any final <laughs> parting thoughts from you? Yep, just one last thing to all the teachers out there that are watching. Don't be afraid to use the language with your students. They will understand it. <laughs> all right. Danielle Dingus is a second grade teacher at Northeast Elementary School in Kinston, yes. North Carolina. Margaret Gale is director of the American Association for Gifted Children here at Duke University. Sandy Darity is chair of African and African American Studies and a professor at the Sanford School of Public Policy at Duke. A recording of this conversation will be available along with thousands of other videos on Duke On Demand, which is ondemand.duke.edu. Produced by Duke University.
online at duke.edu.